Okay, I'm not going to uh, do a big preamble. Uh, no housekeeping, you'll be thrilled to know. So we're going to just crack straight on into the panel. Um, and uh, Rob is just going to step up and introduce the, the panel. And um, I'm just going to hand over, leave it to him. Go. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. So Rob Johnson, uh, Director of Research Consulting. And uh, yep, you can see on, on screen uh, the, the panel we have, we have with us today. So we're kicking off with this panel on uh, constants in a changing world, how societies can survive and thrive in an open future. And, and I guess what gave me the idea for this panel is uh, a piece of work I've been doing for the last few years. Um, I'm part of a consortium monitoring the transition to open access in the UK. And one of the things we do is keep an eye on the, the health of financial societies, so, sorry, learning societies, based on the, the risk that open access could be a threat to societies, might undermine their financial sustainability. And I think what that project has done for me is, uh, is really opened my eyes to the breadth of activities that societies are involved in. And I think it's a, a part of the ecosystem that is very much undervalued and underappreciated. So that was really the aim behind this panel, is to kind of understand a bit more about what societies do, Many of you will, of course, know they do publishing, but they also do a lot more. So we're going to talk a little bit about the role of societies and what the move to open might mean for them. Now, just a little bit of context. There are about 600 learned societies in the UK, um, and just under half of them actually publish <coughs> journals. Uh, and we think they generate revenue from publishing of about 300 million. So it's a pretty significant area of activity but they also do uh, a lot more. So what we've done is bring together a fantastic group of panelists today. They're really the experts, not, not me, so I'm gonna hand over to them, let them introduce themselves, and just make a couple of opening remarks to kick things off. So. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and thank Rob for um, setting up the panel so well. My name's Sally Hardy. I'm the Chief Exec of the Regional Studies Association, which is a medium-sized um, association in the social sciences. So I've been Chief Exec for 30 years. Uh, when I started, there wasn't even a desktop computer in the association office, so we've moved a long way to blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. Um, the pace of change during this period has been both relentless and fantastic in terms of the opportunities it's given to us to improve the quality of service, both for our members and in terms of the public benefit from the association. So we've adopted and, and been resilient and adapted to two types of change, both revolutionary change, online journals, open access, sort of external shocks, but also to evolutionary change. So changing attitudes in higher education, changing attitudes by consumers to whether they are prepared to pay for subscriptions and memberships, then they moved away, now there are signs with um, Spotify and Netflix that people are happy to pay subscriptions again. I've been asked to say very quickly something about the range of activities that the learned societies do. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the publishing. Um, Importantly, we also are um, research funders. The Regional Studies Association has put well over half a million into research, micro-grants, over the last three years. Um, some of those grants are quite innovative. We do early career starter grants that we know are career building because people move after they get them to places where they can get tenure. Our publications, because we own our publications, we've been able to be innovative about them. So we have um, an open access journal um, where we use a panel of, ref a panel of refereeing rather than double, double blind. Um, and we've started two years ago a journal with a unique selling point called Area Development and Policy. And what's unique is that this journal allows the authors to, to write in their own territorial research tradition. So the Brazilians can write in the more descriptive style that they normally use. The Chinese can reference Chinese theoreticians. And generally speaking, these are articles that would find it difficult to be accepted into traditional hybrid journals that are managed in a, um, a European-American tradition. So I think learned societies have a really important role in innovation um, and, and being slightly risk-taking. 
We run conferences and events. I'm not going to say anything about that, other than to say that um, one of the new pressures on event organisers is to watch um, the diversity and inclusive inclusivity of the panels. So really fantastic to be speaking on an all-female panel with Rob as the chair this morning. Thank you. Um, Manal Watch, that out conferences for all male panels, um, have got nothing to say today. Policy and knowledge exchange is a massive growth area for learned societies, um, particularly in the social sciences, but you can reflect on that. Um, and we've started funding policy expos, which are short pieces of research that are answer policy-facing questions that require our whole membership to be involved in the research through focus panels. Um, the, the, the work, the deliverables, are an open access article and a short form policy facing book, which is launched by the association to the policy audience, whatever that policy audience is, and wherever in the world it's most appropriate that we, that we publish it. Um, so we've, we've commissioned our first one, the next three um, we've, we've advertised. So we're waiting to see how that initiative makes a difference. Community building um, is absolutely critical for all of us. And I think most societies are now looking at how they manage their pricing um, in terms of age and geography. So we price by geography. If you live in Bangladesh, you would pay less for your membership of the association than if you live in Australia or, or um, another country. And we're also looking carefully at segregating our members between, between um, value seekers, kind of rank and file membership, and then your super members who have been in membership more than 11 years are really loyal and, and tend to be very active. And if I can have one more minute, Rob, what I would like to f close with is to contextualise where the learned societies are in terms of the risks that we think that we face at the moment. So a piece of work was done by Robert Dingwall in 2014, where he interviewed, um, I think, about 40 social science societies. And the chief execs said that their main risks were economic uncertainty, Brexit, um, exchange rates, pension liabilities, and expiring leases. And I, I would agree with all of those. They are all risks for us. Um, and we'll talk a bit about Brexit um, later, later this morning. It was interesting to me that what didn't come out in that updated piece of research that he did were risks for societies around changing values in higher education. So the marketization of higher education, I think, creates problems for the societies. We work entirely on voluntary basis with our editors, with our referees. We need that voluntary effort in order for the society to, to, to um, operate. Managing the illicit, I think, is a, a becoming a challenge for society um, directors. So how do we manage the fact that Sci-Hub um, has our content? How do we manage the fact that our, um, our content is going up onto ResearchGate in the version of record? It's not only a problem for the publishers, it's also a problem for the societies, because particularly in the social sciences and the humanities, publishing income tends to be a higher part of our, our overall income. The, the both challenge and the opportunity of new technologies like blockchain, I'm not going to say very much about it because others are going to say more, um, but the effect that that has, will have on traditional publishing paradigms has a filter through for the societies. Um, and I can see both opportunities and threats around that. The, the ability to manage micropayments might give us options to move away from a kind of binary divide where it's either a subscriptions model or it's open access. Um, and that seems to me to a very exciting space in which we can all be um, thinking. Um, there are energy um, issues around um, blockchain, by the way, if anyone's interested in sustainability. For me, a massive question, though, is around what GAFA will do. So Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. If they decided to move into academic publishing, how would that impact on publishing business? And how would that impact on the societies? 
So we already have publishing through Amazon. You can self-publish a book and you can produce hard co print copies very, very easily through their platform. If they started moving into publishing academic journals, would they be interested in, publish in starting up communities of, of practice around those academic journals? If they are, that steps right into the territory of the learned societies. Now, at the moment, I think we're a long way from that. Um, and I think the, the real key to um, being resilient around that is, is striving for excellence and innovation in the way in which we operate and the way in which we interact with our members. Um, at a conference in, I'm rapping, I'm rapping, don't panic. Um, at a conference in um, um, uh, just outside Amsterdam um, earlier this year, uh, uh, late last year, Hetton Shah from the Royal Statistical Society said, learned societies should understand that they have no right to exist. And he's right, but put that in the context of our membership at the Regional Studies Association, which has grown 107% in the last five years and grew 20% last year, the biggest area of membership growth was early careers and students. So I don't think, having given you all the problems, I don't think that the future's bleak. I think the future's exciting and challenging. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, hello, my name's um, Catherine Cotton. I'm the chief executive of the Federation of European Microbiological Societies. Thanks also to Rob for inviting us, and, and thanks to Sally for outlining uh, many of the issues that are facing scholarly societies at the moment. And I agree with Heatan that we don't have a divine right to exist simply because we've existed collectively for 350 years. But I think the, the point that um, I'm particularly focused on at the moment is, in addition to all of the things that Sal is talking about, is um, the situation that this, the, the scholarly society se sector as a whole is in. I don't know about you, but I was quite surprised to hear that there's, um, how many was it, 600 scholarly societies in the UK alone, um, 300 million uh, presumably sterling worth of um, journal revenue from that. Um, and that gives you a bit of an idea of how diverse societies are, but not the full picture. So our federation is a federation of 50 scholarly societies. Um, and I think of those, eight have journals. So the remaining 42 don't really have revenue streams at all and actually rely on organizations like ours in order to provide benefits to their members. Our federation um, exists across Europe. We've got members in 36 different countries. We speak lots of different languages. We have exactly the same problems and opportunities that Europe as a whole faces. Um, so in addition to um, the opportunities and, and problems that scholarly societies as single entities face, we have the additional um, problems of, of your, um, and opportunities of Europe. So I've come into this role, which is a fascinating and diverse role, from a fairly, um, it looks a bit of an odd sort of background, but actually it's all about knowledge flows. So I started off as an academic, I worked in environmental campaigning for a while, so that saw me looking at knowledge coming in from academics, but also coming in from people researching in forests on the ground, tracking um, sales from forests to uh, DIY stores, etc., and turning that knowledge into campaigning for, to get public pressure put on issues, and also to put knowledge into um, the fora where policymakers were making the decisions on what's going to happen on climate change or forests. So that's two steps. Then I worked for myself for a bit, so I've seen all of the issues of not being able to um, get access to content through subscription journals because it's pretty expensive. And then I worked for Springer, so I've also worked from the commercial perspective uh, for eight years as a, as a publishing editor. So I've been looking at the knowledge flows, the generation of knowledge, the movement of knowledge, and the use of knowledge um, for the last however many decades it is. And what occurs to me, and particularly comes from the campaigning background, is how important coalition building is. So we have 600 societies in the UK. Some of them will be competing directly with each other. Is that the best use of resources for the communities that, that we collectively are trying to serve? Um, Sally's talked about the grants that um, her organization gives out. 
I worked out the other day, just for something to do, that we spend the same in a year on micro grants to early career researchers as it costs to publish a week's worth of articles in Nature. So is that how the scholarly community wants to see its money spent? I don't know. Um, and the sort of micro grants that Sally's talking about, no, orga no major organization, no academy, no government is going to want to administrate grants at that kind of level. And yet they have huge impact on the development of the disciplines that we're working with. So just to give you two examples, um, we had one early career research grant given to somebody several decades ago who studied in Belgium for three months. And as a consequence, not so much of the techniques that he learned, but of the connections that he made during that stay, he's now the, one of the science ministers in Serbia. We have a similar example of a, a research lab in Athens whose entire research program over the last two decades was built upon the basis of uh, an early career researcher going to work again in the Netherlands and Belgium, making connections and uh, collaborations that have served all of the institutions involved in that since. So my point, I think, is about how coalition building seems to be something that we want, but is something that in a way is quite, no, very hard to develop. And this is where the European Union is looking at the moment for things like input on antibiotic, um, antimicrobial resistance, etc. It's desperate to learn how to build coalitions, and we have the opportunities here to do it. And it's cross-sector coalitions, not just across societies. Um, and in doing this, we can understand better the flow of information. If we're tinkering with little bits of it without understanding the role that the scholarly sector, scholarly society sector, for example, play, what are we going to lose before we notice that we're going to lose it? So that's kind of one of the areas that exercises me. Good morning. Um, my name is Caroline Sutton. I'm with Taylor and Francis. And um, so I'm obviously coming at a slightly different angle because it was quite some time ago that I was a member of a society as a scholar myself. Um, my own personal journey in relationship to open and working with societies in, in questions around open, particularly open access, began in 2007. Um, myself and two other ladies had left actually Taylor and Francis, where I'm now back again, and we'd started Coaction Publishing, which was a full OA publishing house. Um, and at that time, we were going around talking to societies, trying to see, would you be interested in moving your journal to open access? Because there weren't very many at that time. And of course, we either got met with sort of disbelief, what are you asking us? Or um, quite a few said, well, is anybody else doing it? And so that actually led me to do a project with Peter Suber where we began trying to investigate and create a list of societies that um, were either already operating an open access journal or had trans transitioned to an open access journal or were launching one. And that, that list is still going on, actually, um, and is available as a Google Doc, and we published a little bit about that. A uh, short time after that, I think it was in 12 or 13, I worked with JISC in the, this was right in the, which I say, the Finch period, let's say, um, to try and develop some tools together with the Association for Learning Technology here in the UK for societies that were trying to take a look at what they ought to do in relationship to open access, be it green or gold. I think we've come quite a ways from that in that there's still a lot of challenges, and I don't think we want to belabor those here today, but I think most societies now have some understanding of um, what their strategy in relationship to open access publishing is if they, if they manage journals. Um, for myself, my own journey as well has now, I'm back in Taylor and Francis, and um, I've been working a lot with open scholarship and open science since I returned to Taylor and Francis. And I think this conference and many others are, are and along with societies, we're watching how this conversation has moved from talking about open access to publications to now thinking about how do we open up the entire um, research workflow. And so that's where my focus now has been and also when we're talking with societies that I'm often um, now internally asked to, to give some comments on things. Um, I think that the, I should actually, actually say a little bit about what do we mean by open science, open scholarship, because Sally actually pointed this out this morning and it was raised yesterday too. Everyone is talking about something different. And I think that's a really important question. So one area that we've looked at was actually, and talking with some of our societies, was looking at, for example, in the humanities, 
Um, what is the research workflow? And what pieces are there in that that actually could be opened up? Because that's quite different if you're working as a historian than the folks we're working with in extracellular vesicles research, for instance, um, and, and what types of things we could open up. Obviously, data is one area, um, but there's also a number of other things along that workflow. So I just wanted to open up with two things where I think that actually open scholarship, open science, if we're thinking about that workflow and trying to identify what we can open up, um, I think there's really two uh, points I just wanted to open with that I think we can talk more about later as well as other things. Um, one is I do think it's a, a great opportunity because whereas some societies at this point in time, maybe never, are saying we really can't have an open access journal yet. We can't financially move to a different model than what we have today. Um, open scholarship, open science is something that everyone, regardless of what publishing model yet you're following, can actually be engaged with. So I think there's a lot more roads into open and openness, and that engaging in that conversation really gives societies a way to drive that um, open agenda forward. Um, so I think it's a bit less painful because there aren't the financial risks associated with looking at these opportunities contra open access publishing. Um, the second has to do with what uh, Alison Muddit yesterday talked about the cultural change that is necessary. And you'll recall she put up the pyramid that I've seen a number of times and I wish I remembered who actually originally created that pyramid. I don't know if any of you know. No. Um, but at the top was in order to achieve research culture change within research. We need policies from the top. We need the infrastructure on the bottom. And then squeezed between a couple of other layers was communities. And of course, this has to do with changing normative behavior. And we are extremely reliant as we move forward and think about what does open scholarship mean? What does open science mean? What are the practices? We need to define those from a subject base so for example, in, in data sharing, what does it mean for data to be reproducible? Again, in classical history, contra um, you know, some lab science field. So there can be very different things there. And we need subject areas to help inform that conversation about what that means to be fair. And I think this is where societies have an incredibly important role to help us to look at that and understand and define what that means. And some are getting very involved in these areas. Um, and, uh, and I think that also, as you were saying, rather than competing, those are areas where I think societies in the same object, subject areas can also be cooperating. So that rather yesterday there was a comment, someone asked, well, what could publishers do to help the scholarly communications officers? And it said, be consistent. And I think we can throw that also out to the societies together with us as publishers, that we could be working together to try to be consistent, at least within a subject area. Um, so uh, let me just see. I think I don't want to keep going because I think we should have some questions and some um, discussion, actually. But just to throw those two pieces out. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. I think now you've got a, a, a flavor of the, the panel members that we have. If we could just have the next slide, please. So I've got a few, uh, a few qu I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I've got a few questions to, to kick things off over the next 15 or 20 minutes, but we will also have um, a Slido session going. So we're going to leave this up for a few minutes. So do log into Slido. Oh, is this not working? Can you hear me OK? Yeah. So uh, do log into Slido, um, do add your own questions, and we'll pick some of those up towards the end of the session. But um, initially, I just wanted to sort of pick up on the, some of Caroline's points about the move to open. And um, you know, I think it was interesting what you were saying, Sally, about what are, what are societies worried about? You know, it's the economic situation, it's international context, it's all of these other factors. It's not you know, open access destroying your society, which, which I think was kind of a, a sense a few years ago that this could be much more damaging than it's so far proven to be. Yeah. So I think my question is, you know, is, is this actually now more of an opportunity, the move to open, or is it just that that risk has been deferred and it's, it's still lurking there in the background? So maybe Caroline, if you want to just give your thoughts initially. I, I think there's a real opportunity here because I think this is, um, you know, rather than being dragged along, as I think a lot of societies felt with open access to a certain extent, I think we're still, you know, on the ground floor with open scholarship, open science. I think there's a real opportunity to be a part of actually being the transformative force in that and helping to define and push that forward. Um, so, 
and again, I think the financial risks associated with that were somewhat less. I think there will be challenges for those societies that are perhaps smaller, perhaps self-published, a very small number of journals, maybe even only one, because all, obviously all of the connecting all of these things is a huge challenge. Um, certainly as a publisher, as I said, I, I was a smaller publisher. We had 35 titles, and that's now part of Taylor and Francis. And part of the reason for that was getting our arms around all of the new challenges in the new environment. Um, are quite challenging. So I think there are potentially some financial challenges and some, ch some challenges if you're doing self-publishing um, or on a smaller scale with things. However, I think that being able to be a part of driving things forward is a real opportunity and showing value to members as well that we're going to help you navigate. In the same way I think that we as publishers are trying to work with our societies, we want to help navigate through what's coming here on this, this um, new landscape. Because scientists themselves, some are very engaged, but others just don't have the time. You know, which of these many social media you know, tools should I be using? Um, yeah. But I think these ladies may be able to answer that even better, actually. Um, okay, Kath, um, what do you think? Um, I, I think in an ideal world, I would see open access as a fantastic opportunity. Um, small, small and medium-sized industries can't have subscriptions to journals, um, not that they necessarily have the uh, capacity to actually read a lot of the literature. My question is, or my, my concerns are about um, barriers to authorship that are um, put in place by um, APCs. I'm concerned about the barrier to uh, publishing, which in combination with open access is an issue, which is uh, everybody's favorite, the journal level impact factor. Um, if we didn't have that, we would be in a completely different situation, I think. Um, and I can't remember what my third point was going to be. <laughs> but those are, the, those are the two of the, the key things that occur to me. Oh, no, the third point is, um, is open access working? If it, dep it depends, as you say, open access means different things to different people. Uh, but if you listen to the taxpayers are paying for the research and therefore should have access to the content um, line, then I would argue that actually the majority of content that's published in learned journal, in scholarly journals, is not accessible to the public no matter how much physical access they have to it. Uh, they can't understand the content. So, um, and this is another area where the impact factor maybe plays a part. And it was some stuff that came up in the discussion yesterday about science communication. What is it? What would encourage, what would be the incentives for authors to um, publish different types of article? that then being published open access and reaching different audiences might actually be valuable in terms of addressing problems, um, et cetera. So those are my kind of three thoughts, is that potentially it's a fantastic opportunity, but I don't believe that the way that it's set up at the moment, and particularly in combination with the journal level impact factor, can work. Sally, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I agree with the points that Kath has made, particularly around um, um, the challenges for authors. And I think it's really important to remember that authorship is not just UK. So it's not only authors who would have access to APC funding through the block grant that we're talking about here. It is also researchers in parts of the world where they don't have access to the kind of funding that would allow them to, to publish if gold open access in um, journals that are published in Northern, uh, Northern Europe or in, or in the States. Um, so I think that is an issue. Um, I was part of the cohort who in 2013-14 worried that um, we were looking at a cliff with open access. I was um, agitated, I did get involved and I did advocate around don't forget the learned societies, let's use the mixed economy. I did a lot of um, presentations at the time um, those fears are mitigated by the way in which the world has, um, has turned since. I think the real, a real challenge for the societies is knowing which of the innovations that are, that are here and are coming to invest our time and money in. There are so many different things. So some things are becoming quite mainstream. So ORCID, ORCID is here. But three years ago, it, it wasn't nearly so, um, you know, we, we got on the, on the um, bandwagon with that. We were encouraging our researchers to, to register for an ORCID number. Um, we got involved in QDOS. 
um, encouraging our authors to use social media to promote their work, to increase its um, discoverability, its readability, and hopefully then to increase its impact and the public benefit from it. Um, for me, I suppose the challenge is that the change is so rapid and the number of startup companies is so vast that staying on top of what might be the good ideas is really tricky. And that's where a society like mine, we've got 13 staff spread around the world, um, we really rely on our publishers to try and interpret that for us and point us to where the major possibilities are for us. So I think blockchain technology is really exciting. I think it offers potentially a third way, a different kind of journal model that sits between the sub subscriptions model and open access. I'm not sure how that would be articulated. I don't know if um, my publisher will, um, will move rapidly. And the other final point I would make is quite often for societies like mine that use a commercial publisher, we're, we're, um, we move at the pace of change of our publisher because we don't have the finances to move alone. And that's where I think Kath's um, comments that she's made several times now on panels about societies collaborating begins to have a really important um, message. Um, because we, we could do some things collectively. So, so Caroline, there's a lot of expectation on publishers there. Do you want to respond to that? <laughs> well, I just wanted to make a couple of things uh, uh, around payments, um, for example. So, um, you know, I think everyone is aware most publishers do offer waivers for authors from certain countries. I also think that, Contra, when I first jumped into this myself in 2006, and finding funding to pay for an APC was very difficult, but the fact that we have more and more institutions that are making funding available and funders making uh, funds available for um, open access is certainly um, been helpful. I think for a lot of the societies that were very successful with the open access publishing earlier on was those societies that maybe they were the primary, the, the bulk of subscriptions came from the society members, so they've been able to kind of flip because it, it more or less costs the same. So you could flip and you could then um, you know, get all that benefit of open access and still have kind of the same financial model. So obviously th those challenges are still there. Um, but I take your point that the, the pace of change is also to a certain extent determined by, by your publisher who in turn is waiting, you know, moving with being pushed as well. So, um, yeah. Okay. Mm. Now, I, I can see we've got some great questions yeah. coming through on Slido. So actually I'd, I'd like to move to that now, I think, because some of them relate to this, this topic before we move on to others. So. I think we've got that there, but yeah, there's the top question. Would the wider mission of societies be better served by converting all their journals to OA, even if they generate lower revenues? Who'd like to take that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in the sense that the journals uh, play a part of what we do, then that wouldn't necessarily be affected unless, of course, a journal became unviable because of, because of the reduction in revenues. Um, but in, in terms of how much additional, um, how many, how much additional in terms of activities the journals support, um, I mean, Sally talked earlier about the, the importance of community building. And this is, this is something that is absolutely critical. It doesn't matter how much technology develops in terms of um, being able to communicate across the world. People want to meet face to face, even if it's only once, but they want to, they want to meet face to face before they get involved in uh, risky, collaborative um, um, possibilities, or even sort of not risky, but anything that you spend your time on is, is something that you've chosen to spend your time on. And this, um, these opportunities for, for scholars to meet regularly um, is, is something that the scholarly societies are absolutely critical to. So in terms of our funding that is funded entirely generated by our journals, we give out um, something in the region of 20 to 30 um, meeting organiser grants a year. Now we don't fund the entire meetings but we contribute to allowing something like 3,000 researchers around the world to meet at um, events that our members organise. We provide the funds to bring in high-level speakers who are going to attract people to those events and who will bring their research groups with them so that people want to go and meet uh, those researchers and, 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 st and start talking about collaborations. 
We also provide sort of 300 meeting grants, meeting attendance grants a year for early career researchers. And we hold a congress every year where we give about 100,000 um, euros in attendance grants to people from around the world, including specifically recently from um, Latin America. So these are all huge opportunities for networking and meeting face to face that aren't going to happen if scholarly societies um, aren't organizing them or some alternative comes in their place. I'm not saying that we're the only um, organizations that can do it, but we are the organizations that are doing it. And I think that there's a very dangerous kind of risk here of a loss to the overall knowledge ecosystem that we're not really taking into account. And we're not able to take it into account because we don't actually have the data on it. And this would be a starting point with, with better collaboration would be, what is it that we collectively offer? If there's 600 societies in the UK, how many are there in the world? Thank you. Well, I, I want to move us on uh, beyond open access. And, uh, and I think, Sally, you were saying um, some of the things that Robert Dingwall's study identified that uh, chief execs do worry about. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about how you see the environment at the moment? And for those playing the scholarly communications bingo, I think it's time maybe for the B word to get mentioned, so Brexit. Um, what does this mean for, for you as a society? Uh, yeah, Brexit. <coughs> I saw recently, um, actually yesterday on Twitter, that um, a very enterprising pottery in the Staffordshire area has brought out Brexit egg cups, and one says soft Brexit and the other says hard Brexit. Uh, so I thought they were great. Um, Brexit's a massive challenge for my organisation. So unlike many um, associations, um, we are um, multidisciplinary and we're international. Two thirds of our membership, over two thirds of our membership is overseas. Um, so we are different from many national societies. <coughs> a lot of our members are in mainland Europe. We'd have a lot of partnership working with the EU institutions. In the immediate aftermath of the, Vex, uh, the Brexit vote, I had two very telling conversations. One from a senior official, EU official, who said, it's been fantastic working with you, but I guess now I'm going to have to work with, your, with, with the other society in your field, um, that, which was um, very disappointing for me, given that I'd spent 15 years building up a, a close relationship. And another phone call was from a member from Sweden who said, Sally, I've really enjoyed and taken a lot out of our membership, but I suppose in order to continue my research collaborations, I'll now have to look at some of the other societies. And that, for me, meant we had to move, and we had to move quickly. So the association immediately started to investigate the ways in which we could have a legal personality in Europe so that we, um, the um, Regional Studies Association is still based within the UK, but now we have a private foundation which we fund in Belgium. And we were one of the first, if not the first, society to respond in that way. Um, and the discussions to make sure that we set that up in a way that would work for us would have the confidence of our EU partners and the confidence of our EU members. It involved me in conversations with solicitors. I met with senior officials from the Cabinet Office who are working in the uh, voluntary sector. Um, and we also liaised with a number of major university institutions that are doing similar things, although the universities seem to have opted for the Netherlands, I think because English is more, more, um, more readily spoken there. So for, for, for me, Brexit has been, was, a, was a horrible shock, very unwelcome. Uh, over half of my staff team are mainland Europeans. They were rocked and they're young, bright, contribute massively to what we do, and all of them started talking about the need to relocate um, out of the UK. Hopefully, I will now keep them. Um, so internationalizing um, has been challenged. The, the, the many, many societies in response to flattening publishing incomes have looked at how to balance their revenue and their income. The obvious thing, if you've saturated your um, membership in your national context, is to go international. So there's a study done by the Professional uh, yeah, this PAN, the Professional Associations Research something PAN, 2017, 
they've done a report on internationalisation of learned societies, and they show that overseas activities contribute 12% of income to the societies in the UK that they surveyed. They surveyed about 90, had responses from 90. Um, they found that 80% of those societies had some overseas membership, but that all of them had um, uh, uh, development plans which sought to grow their international membership, and most of them were seeking to grow it, with it with, by 50% in the very near future. So internationalising is a really key theme for the societies. So Caroline, do you want to come in on that? Or? Um, actually, I, I feel as someone living in Norway, I don't have a lot to say about <laughs> Brexit. <laughs> 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 well, I wonder if we could move on to the, the next question on the top there about the, the responsibilities to, to educate uh, society members in best practice in scholarly communication. I mean, I, I might come to you first, Cameron, because I know you do a lot on open scholarship and the implications of that. So as a, maybe as a publisher, what do you see your role as being? And then we might move on mm. to the role of societies. I, I really feel that as a publisher, we do have uh, an important role to play, both in terms of the editors that we work with, but also the societies that we are trying to catalyze some conversations where they might not be happening yet. Um, some of our societies, some of our editors are well versed in certain aspects of say data sharing or they want to sign the top guidelines, uh, they want to have badges on their articles and you know and they're coming to us. Others are a little bit more reluctant or a little bit unsure. So I think that we have a, a role to play um, in having those conversations and kind of getting um, those that we work with, our partners, to be thinking about what possibilities are out there. Um, again, with this collaborative approach of thinking how do we work to help transform this together. Um, and just as an example on data, and I know other publishers have done the same, you know, we've got a suite of data policies now. The idea being that we need to have conversations. So our editorial staff are going out this year and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of the societies we work with to ask questions to help find out which would be the appropriate policy in this field and for this journal. So, so I think being able to have those conversations and, and try to push some topics on the agenda that might not be um, being discussed as yet. Uh, is really important. Thank you. Mm. Kath, what, what's your view on that, the role of societies there? I think it's, I think it's more of an opportunity, than, or as, at least as much an opportunity mm. as a responsibility. Um, I think it's key to note that most societies are pretty small, um, and that one way that we're looking at, at doing exactly this um, is to partner with organisations that actually do this as their core business. So we're talking to Sense About Science recently. So rather than trying to invent something ourselves, we're looking at what partners can provide those services and what do we offer them. So I think, yes, it's, it's definitely a huge thing, potential for societies. Do you want to add anything, Sam? I, I agree, it's, um, it's massive. And um, it, it is one of the things that we do for millennials who are looking to us to help them kickstart their, their careers. Um, yeah, so we promote um, the uptake of all kids, which, which is big here, but not, not huge in other parts of the world. Um, we, we try to educate on the use of social media and so on. Yeah. So I guess picking up on that point about millennials, it was really interesting you were saying that your, your membership has grown so much because yeah. we, you, know, you might think with academic social networks and, and you know, all these other ways for scholars to interact that the role of societies might be in decline. So what, what's driving that growth from your perspective? Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's different, I think. I think it's about the value that the society gives. So some societies, um, and, and I know that Het and Shah at um, the meeting last year talked about an initiative that they're considering giving free membership to um, student members. We charge our student members and we get increasing numbers of them joining. And I think it is about getting that value proposition right for them. So there are, there's grant funding, there's travel um, bursaries for them. Um, we work really hard on their networking opportunities. We have early career editors on our journals. Um, so these are um, competitions um, and they become an editor for three years, mentored by another editor, and at the end they cycle off. So career building. We've also offered now, um, each of our conferences, we do early career plenary speakers and they send in a written um, abstract and a video abstract so that we can uh, assess their um, presentation skills. 
um, and career building to, to give a plenary presentation along some, alongside some of the most well-known speakers in your field. So we're working quite hard to be um, imaginative about the way in which we get um, our student and our early career members involved, but in fairness, they are driving the agenda. They have their own group, they have their own Facebook site, they, it's quite active, um, and they're coming to us with ideas for how, how we can help them. Thank you. Well, I wanted to move on just to think about the, the future and what comes next for societies. And I, and I guess, um, you know, I titled this session Constance in a Changing World. Um, and I, what I wanted to encapsulate there is some of the sort of opportunities and the challenge of, you know, having been around in some cases for hundreds of years, but yeah. dealing with a very rapidly changing environment, technological developments, how do societies adapt? So I wonder, Kath, if I could come to you just for your thoughts on, you know, what have you got to do to remain relevant going forward? <laughs> well, I mean, I think we're talking about everything that we've just been talking about. So um, what is it that millennials need? Um, who's driving the agenda? What are the different relationships of the, um, the societies and the different partners that they, uh, the different responsibilities and roles of the, of the different partners within um, or with whom scholarly societies uh, work? Um, one of the things that I see, and this addresses a number of issues, although I'm not sure it directly addresses your question, is that at the moment, and I know there's a question here about um, FEMS and OUP, at the moment societies either self-publish or they co-publish with um, publishers. And we've looked at the figures and for us it's definitely financially advantageous, but also in terms of expertise, the sorts of things that Sally were talking about, we're not a publishing organisation, we're not an events organisation, we're a scholarly society. And so we work with professional partners who, whose core business it is to organise events and or publish. Um, but one thing that occurs to me is that as technology is changing, there are more opportunities for scholarly societies to start the collaboration programme that I'm talking about. So in the past it would be quite difficult in a way to to cross, to, to collaborate with um, other societies. But something that we've been doing recently, just as an example, um, is publishing uh, virtual special issues across all the five FEMS journals and the, and the 20 journals that our member societies also publish that are um, indexed in, in Web of Science. So, and at first this was an amazing and why would we do it kind of a thing for people, but it's become normal now. So it's, it, also ref, it also refers back to the issue of, of changing people's mindset on, on certain things. And I think that at the moment the technological potential, and I agree with Sally about keeping on, to, on top of that is impossible, but the technological potential is much greater than we're able to realise because the barriers are not so much the technology, but the the practices and, and, and completely understandable business models of the publishers. So what I would be looking for is, are there any win-win situations where publishers don't lose but societies benefit from being able to kind of cross-platform um, collaborations? Caroline, do you see any of those win-win situations? <laughs> Um, are you thinking in terms of doing virtual issues, for example, from two different journals, or um, just issues, thinking of some examples? Virtual issues we do, but for example, um, so so you've got a big 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 publisher with a number of society journals whose portfolio in that discipline benefits from having those society journals in it, so they can kind of you know cross sell their mm -hmm. proprietary content with our society content but we can't cross-sell our society content with our member society content, for example. Ah, oh, okay. So um, there are a few small examples like that. So there's a, there's a marketing tool that's out there right now. We can actually recommend content mm. to other journals um, called TrendMD, which I know that we're testing at Taylor and Francis with a list of our titles. Um, so so there's, there, there's some of that happening in and terms of the... Cross that would be cross-publisher platform marketing, actually, to try and capture. Because, of course, what we're moving to, I think, in, in, in OA is a world in which we we're focused on a journal where now we need systems that are actually focused on the article. 
mm. um, because an author is just interested in getting all that content regardless of where it is, right? So, so understanding that if I've got someone whose eyes are on this article, Trend Envy is a, a kind of plugin that then can send you over to recommended content that goes across other platforms of participating publishers. So that's, that's perhaps one example. I think where there is some cooperation and where I think this would fit in with some of the society cooperation as well is, you know, I think we have to distinguish between what do we do in terms of being competitive and what are just some basic standards and practices and that we've been talking about in the, for example, um, in two of, I know, the workshops here. You know, there's things where this isn't what's competitive. This is where we need to, to cooperate to make things work for everybody. Mm. And, and there we, I think there's quite a bit going on that's, that's um, across the industry and, and cooperation. Mm -hmm. mm. So, so I guess to pick up one of the questions there, there's quite a bit going on, but why isn't there more collaboration happening? Because societies do seem to have quite tightly defined memberships. They're maybe not as willing to collaborate. Like, we don't tend to see mergers of societies very often at all. Is, do you see that changing in the future? Or are there good reasons for it being as it is, Sally? No, I, I, think, it, I think it will change, um, mainly because um, we will not solve wicked societal problems within a single discipline and we will not solve those problems within a single research tradition. So it is not enough for us to, to look at problems of migration and the economic integration of migrants into um, the economies of the countries in which, they, in which they end up, only from the point of view of economics or only from the point of view of geography. We have to start to collaborate. And, and I do think that will begin to happen. Um, and initiatives like virtual special issues that take um, articles from um, many pieces, um, journals like Contemporary Social Science, which is published by Taylor and Francis, which is um, a, um, an interdisciplinary journal which pulls to, um, does themed issues but with papers from people from different um, disciplinary backgrounds. These are really important initiatives and, and there is a kind of growth, I think, in the interest in taking part in these projects. Foresight for Cities project was funded by the government and put together an architect, an economist, um, uh, an economic geographer and so on in order to look at the problems for the growth of cities in the, in the UK. I, I do think collaboration will come. There isn't a tradition of mergers. Um, the Charity Commission, in fairness, blows hot and cold on charity mergers. Um, and at the moment, it's suggesting uh, it leans towards cold, that it's very difficult to bring the cultures together. Um, but there are umbrella bodies that, that I think most of us belong to. So my organisation is part of the Academy for Social Science, um, and there are national academies. And within those, there are initiatives for collaboration. So I think a lot of it happens, it's just not very visible. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, there are plenty more questions on Slido, but I know not everyone may have access to Slido, so I did just want to open it up. If there's one or two questions from the floor, we do have a roving microphone. Any hands? Anthony. Anthony Watkinson. Um, do the panel think that learned societies are who represent researchers are being listened to by government. I'm thinking particularly here of the EU because I once did a small study on the expert panels which supposedly explain researchers to EU and I found that I couldn't trace any activity in learning societies among any of the members. So I wonder, okay? Um, I think uh, policy influence is a massively knotty area. It's very difficult to, um, to identify who it is that you need to influence and then build up the relationship which would end up in influencing the decision makers. Um, it's something that for FEMS we're starting to look at, but we're starting to look at by finding out who in our members' membership is already involved in, in policy processes. Um, and, but I do think that in terms of listening to societies as entities, this is partly where the collaboration comes in, because if we and our members give 50 different views on antimicrobial resistance, clearly it's going to be difficult for us to get our message across. I mean, I can imagine that getting consensus between uh, societies 
could take a while. I mean, it's a long-term process. But that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about working more collaboratively so that we do present a single voice which then is significant enough to, to be listened to. But it's also about understanding the processes actually involved. Uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful and exciting part of my job, the, the, um, the knowledge exchange section of it. Um, we do a lot of work in Europe um, and we found working with the European Commission um, both a challenge and an opportunity. So we partner with them in the European Week of Regions and Cities and we run the university which showcases academic research on regional studies to around 6,000 policymakers and practitioners every, um, every October. Um, and that's a project we've been involved with for um, almost 10 years. Um, we, we've been involved in consultations with Bayes around industrial strategy. But I think what's the important take home around this is that these are long-term relationships that you build into the relevant departments for your society. It's not a quick fix, it doesn't come very easily. And the traditions of working are very different. So I spoke at a heads of analysis, government um, researchers are called the heads of analysis in each of the major government departments. Um, and we had researchers there and the senior civil servants. And everything is different. So what's data is different for a, uh, an academic researcher and somebody in, in government. Time frames are very different. The, the um, expectations are very different. So matching all of this is massively complicated. Um, the civil servants think that the academics should do it for love. The academics could, but that doesn't, pay to, that doesn't make a contribution towards their long-term career goals. They're not credited for doing pieces of analysis of that kind. So it's really complicated, but it is absolutely critical, I think, for the future value, part of the granular value of a society to its membership. So we are just about out of time, but I wonder whether I might just turn to you, Caroline, just to pick up a couple of the questions there briefly about the relationship with commercial publishers and how do you think societies and publishers can best collaborate going forward? Um, are you thinking in terms of open scholarship, open science, or anything really? Anything, yeah, anything at all. really, anything <laughs> really, yeah. Um, well, you know, I think just picking up um, on some points that both Sally and, and Catherine made about, you know, there's just there's so many changes going on and you know we recognize that many of the societies are smaller so a big part of our role as publishers is to help keep our arms around what's going on so that we can engage in conversations and you may pick up some things that we don't because you're in a different position and we can share that information with one another um, I think this is a really good example where it works really really well um, where if one can approach that as a collaboration and really talk openly about what are the challenges, what could be the options, what's the best way forward. I think even as a publisher where um, we might see opportunities for actually turning to open access, let's say, because the journal might be growing. Someone had a question here about, um, I think it was something with a number of articles and couldn't they sometimes have some, some um, papers published open in order to push it in that direction. And we do have some titles where there's such a backlog that there might be an opportunity there. So I think it's also that, you know, feeling comfortable that you have a publisher that's looking out for your best interests and is understanding where are you as a society at, um, and trying to also understand if there's something latent need that you might have that we're, we're starting to see emerge on the landscape so that we can help push, uh, point that out and together navigate that going forward. Um, We've talked a lot about relationship building. We were talking with the EU, and I think that's a big part of it. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to have to draw things to a close, as I'm just about time to send you to the to the workshops. Can I just ask you to join me in thanking our panel, Sally Hardy, Kath Cotton, and Caroline Sutton? Thank you. Thank you indeed. Excellent panel. I'm sure we've, we've all learnt a lot from that, so thank you very much to the panellists. Um, right, it now falls for me to just send you on your way to workshops. Um, after that, we, we have a break uh, at 11.20, so you've basically got um, less than an hour um, to solve whatever problem your workshop is wrestling with. Um, the break is kindly sponsored by Wiley, um, and then after the break, we'll be back here for some presentations. So, to your workshops, fly. <laughs>